Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, New Curriculum, Preparing the Team and Making Sure Your New Techs Get and Stay Involved. This session was planned for Lifesavers 2020 and is provided by Safe Kids Worldwide and Lifesavers. Today's speakers are Mandy with the Center for Safe Alaskans, Amanda with the Georgia Governor's Office of Highway Safety, and Jesse with the U.S. Department of Transportation. Hello, and welcome to the National Child Passenger Safety Technician Certification Training Quizzes. This presentation was originally designed for the Lifesavers Conference, but we are glad to be able to share it with you now. My name is Mandy Seeteller. I work for the Center for Safe Alaskans. I'm a CPS technician and instructor. I also serve as the statewide CPS coordinator for the Alaska Highway Safety Office. And I am the curriculum chair for the National Child Passenger Safety Board. The goals of the technician certification training are to actually provide a basic technical knowledge about car seats, booster seats, and seatbelt systems. What we want to do is provide our adult learners with opportunities to develop and practice their communication skills so that they can educate caregivers. The intent is that the content is delivered in a nationally standardized manner. It should be cumulative and because each module builds on the preceding module. And it must be delivered in its entirety in order and may not be altered in any way, including addition or deletion of content. Quiz revisions. First and foremost, thank you so much for your patience and your support as we have worked through um, some revisions to these quizzes, we wanted to make them just absolutely stellar and on point. Based on your feedback from the curriculum feedback form, a final edit was made to the quizzes and it was released to instructors on February 17th. Moving forward, there will not be any further revisions to the curriculum before next year. We have updated a version A and version B and you can see the list of the documents that are available for each version. A combined answer keys, um, quiz one and quiz two, all of the forms are in your instructor download section. I hope that you have taken time to read the instructor prep guide. It is an amazing document and is going to provide you a lot of support. And it's something that you should probably read every time you host a course or attend a course. It gives direction on the quizzes, starting on page 15, the instructor guidelines for administrating quizzes. And one question that I've always had that I wanted um, to share with you that we have clarified is that instructors may highlight or stress material that is on the quiz during the module instruction, but they can't indicate that the material is a quiz question and instructor teams are discouraged from using the quizzes as a review tool. The special accommodations section has been updated. It gives guidance for physical requirements, testing accommodations, suggests some verbiage on how you can talk to your students about it. We want everyone to feel comfortable and welcome. Please make sure that you re-familiarize re yourself with it prior to each course. Let's talk about the completion requirements. So you need to pass all three written quizzes, just like in the previous curriculum, with a total of 42 of 50 questions answered correctly. The recommended time for completion is 30 minutes or a predetermined time limit greater than 30, but less than 45. We wanna make sure that the students know exactly how long they have to take the quiz. The quiz should be followed by 15 minutes of a post quiz review, and there are no retakes. One of the things I wanted to point out, we've had a few questions about the length of quiz one. It is 21 questions, it is on the first day, but the five modules that are covered on quiz one are roughly 41.6% of the modules and they represent 42% of the questions overall. So it's very in line with the number of questions versus the number of modules covered. And as all of you know, day one is um, primarily classroom instruction. Of course, there are a few 
activities outside, but our skills evaluations happen later. And the next two or three days, depending on how many days you run the course, there'll be more time outside. So having more test questions based off of the written and classroom information is appropriate. Quiz two has 13 questions and quiz three has 16. It is important that after each quiz, instructors should take some time to evaluate and perhaps adjust the teaching styles a little bit for the needs of the student. Every class is put together a little bit differently, depending on what group you're teaching to. Is it a mixed group? Is it a specific group? Um, and we want to make sure that we take time to address any areas that might need a little bit of help and pace the course accordingly. An effective instructor identifies students who are struggling and they ask questions, they adjust their teaching style. Everyone learns a little bit differently. This curriculum has been specifically written for the adult learner, so we believe it will be easier for people to grasp the concepts, especially with the learn practice explain. Um, and each instructor teaches just a little bit differently in their style, so we wanna make sure that we use the quizzes as a guide to let us know what we can do to improve. We want to stress that the student's experience should be positive. So whatever we need to talk to the students about, if we need to do some adjustments, we don't want to make anyone feel bad or cause them additional stress. So we want to make sure it's a really positive experience. And if it is positive, they're going to be more likely to volunteer at your events, um, use their new skills because they'll feel confident, they'll reach out to others in their community, and they're more likely to recertify. There are going to be times when a student fails a quiz and again we want to still make sure that that student has a positive experience so we want to delicately handle that situation in order to preserve their privacy, um, avoid any embarrassment. We need to have a plan as we go in to make sure we know what we're going to do or what we're going to say or who's going to take care of it because we don't want to be shouting out from the back of the room, hey, you know, this didn't happen. So it's really important that we take time to be thoughtful and make sure that each student feels supported by the instructor team. You never know, that student may come back. General guidelines. The instructor guidelines in the instructor prep guide, page 15, list all of these bullet points. Instructors must follow the general guidelines and administration guidelines. Um, students must work independently without collaboration of other students. Quizzes are open book. Um, they may use electronic devices to research the answers, but they may not collaborate with students, instructors, or persons outside of the class. Instructors can still help define non-CPS terms, but they can't answer the questions. And answers must not be provided to the student. Quizzes should be scored by an instructor on the team. The instructor candidates can score but they need to do it under the supervision of their mentor and the mentor needs to sign behind the instructor to cabinet. Quizzes must not be shared with non-course participants. So again, back to the instructor prep guide, page 15 gives very detailed information on the administration guidelines. And the mandatory instructor pre-course meeting is a great time to review. With the changes and updates to the curriculum, the instructor pre-course meeting is a really great time to address how you're going to administer quizzes, how you're going to set up your skills. It's an opportunity to make sure your entire instructor team is on the same page. Do I have to read all the information? <laughs> yes, the training is standardized and in order to ensure the same testing environment for all students, Instructor teams must read all the information included in the read to students um, before each quiz. And you can find more information there on page 18 of the instructor prep guide. Instructions, this is what is listed on the quiz that you'll be handing out to the students. And um, we want to remind them to use the quiz answer sheet provided so they can record their answers. That's where we'll also be marking the tests. They need to work independently without collaboration with other students or instructors. All of the answers are available in the technician guide. 
And they may use electronic devices to research the answers, for example, if for some reason they felt they needed to look up car seat instruction manuals. The training is designed for the adult learners and instructor teams will provide all the students for the students to grasp the key concepts and learning objectives in the instruction. This is a standardized course and must be offered in this format um, using the PowerPoint and the classroom instruction. And the experience should be the same regardless of where the course is administered. So the testing guidelines that are given in one state are the exact same as they should be in another state. Students should be allowed to use their phones during testing. Um, again, going back to the previous slide, they have to work independently. They can't collaborate with others. There are safeguards in place to prevent cheating. Um, the testing environment is controlled. The instructors are in the room, um, proctored by the instructor team. The quizzes and skills evaluations all have time limits, which make it really difficult to um, spend a lot of time researching the internet. They have to pass both the quizzes and the skills evaluation. So their hands-on knowledge and those skills will demonstrate that they are truly understanding the content. Two versions of the quizzes are available to discourage cheating. The board will continue to monitor feedback from the field via the curriculum feedback form to determine if there are any, any identified occurrences of cheating. Please use the curriculum feedback form, not only for this topic, but for any concerns you have about the curriculum. The student score sheet is fillable. I don't know about you, but I struggle a little bit with my handwriting sometimes. It's difficult to read. So being able to type onto the PDF has been a lifesaver for me. That is available on the instructor downloads. So I know that's a really brief overview um, at Lifesavers. I was going to have copies of the quizzes, the instructor prep guide, the planning and logistics. I am still available to answer all of those questions. If you'd like to reach out, I would be happy to talk with you about your specific questions. So please feel free to give me a call at any time. And I wanna let you know how much the board appreciates all of your input and your feedback and your support. Um, the board, NHTSA, and Safe Kids worldwide have worked collaboratively and exhaustively to make sure that this curriculum revision is thoughtful and meets the needs of our future technicians. I do want to point out that CPS is a family affair. Um, that is my little baby in module seven, and my husband was a willing volunteer for some photos for module nine. And then just a big hug to my other sons serving in our military. I want to thank you for your time today and I encourage you to reach out with questions at any time. Thank you. Good morning everyone. As Stephanie said, my name is Amanda Jackson and I had the opportunity to pilot the 2020 curriculum in Griffin, Georgia in September of 2019. I had the opportunity to teach with Tracy Reese, Debbie Strait, Julia Harmon, and Victoria Brossard. Their picture is in this PowerPoint as well. And then in Febu February of 2020, I had the opportunity to teach the new curriculum in Columbus, Georgia, where the lead instructor was Julia Harmon. So I'm really excited to talk to you today about what I've learned in these past two classes and to give you some helpful tips when you start teaching your classes this spring. So our objective is we want to mentor CPSC instructors for the new curriculum. We want to prepare for class activities and skills evaluations. We want to discuss available webinars and curriculum resources. So we're mentoring instructors. It is helpful to assign a backup instructor for each module. There's a lead, the main instructor teaching the module, but the backup instructor is following along in the book and making sure nothing is missed that students will need to know for that module. You can also co-teach the modules, whether it's instructors alternating topics or slides or breaking up the section half to make sure that they understand all the concepts needed to be, become a successful technician. And you can also utilize the recommended evaluation process for instructor feedback. And the evaluation forms are important because as instructors, we get better when we know what we did well on 
and things that we can improve on. To download the evaluation forms, you can log on to your Safe Kids profile. And on the left hand side, there is a hyperlink that says Instructor Downloads. You can click on that link and then it takes you to the National Child Passenger Safety Board website. There is a password on your Safe Kids profile that you can enter. And on their website, there are the evaluation forms, the PowerPoint slides, and other resources that are beneficial to when you're implementing your 2020 CPSD class. So when we're preparing for the class, it is important to build in some extra time, whether it's building maybe an extra 30 minutes in every day if an activity or module goes longer than expected. And then what we've been doing is, if you prefer a three-day class, maybe making a three and a half day class for the first time you're teaching the curriculum, or if you're doing a three and a half day class, maybe making it a four day class just to make sure you have enough time for all the activities and modules to be completed successfully. The 2020 curriculum does involve more outside activities. And so making sure you have a good location is key. So not being too far away from the parking lot, not having to go up and down many stairs or going up and down an elevator because you will lose time having to have students travel in and out multiple times throughout the day. And dolls and stuffed animals are now a requirement for harnessing during skills two. In the 2014 curriculum, they were a recommendation, but now they are a requirement. So when you're preparing for the class, it is important to work with the other instructors on your team to make sure you have enough dolls for harnessing and enough variety of sizes for the different scenarios. Now I wanna talk about some of the different activities in the 2020 curriculum and some tips and tricks that may be helpful for you. So for the cl first class activity in module two, students will work in pairs and the least experienced student will complete the car seat installation first. When we were doing the pilot, we noticed that the student who may have small children in their family they were doing the installation and the least experienced student was simply copying their work. So just to make sure that the least experienced student does go first. The overall activity is 20 minutes long, 10 minutes outside, and then a 10 minute discussion inside. So each student gets five minutes to do their installation. They can pick any car seat that they like and they can, do, they can install it any way. And please remind students not to leave the video from their cell phone until the class is complete. It's really cool for the students to see how far they come over the past couple of days from the first installation to their last installation at the end of day three. The next activities I wanna to talk to you about are in modules eight, nine, and 10. Module eight is our rear facing module. Module nine is our forward facing module. Module 10 is our booster seat module. You want to refer to the checklist in the planning and logistics guide to ensure you have enough car seats. It's on page 11 to 13. It's super helpful. It says the type of car seats that you need as well as what features they should have. So when you're preparing with your instructional team, you can make sure that you have a good variety of seats. And please prepare to bring multiple combinations and all-in-one car seats. Module 10, the booster seat module has increased with activity and it's really great for the students to get that hands-on experience. So slide 19 of module 10, it talks about the booster seat conversion activity the students do in class. Students take a combination or all-in-one car seat. They have to remove the harness and put the harness back on. With that being said, you wanna make sure that you have enough combinations and all-in-one car seats for students to do this activity in class, especially if you're going to have a larger class. The other activity in module 10 is the booster seat installation activity. It's slide 23 in the PowerPoint and students have 20 minutes outside to install booster seats in different types of modes. They install a low back booster, a high back booster, a combination seat in the booster mode, and an all-in-one seat in the booster mode. They can work in small groups to do this. 
And during the pilot, as well as the Columbus class, we ran into the fact that we did not have enough combinations or all-in-ones, and we had a little bit of a wait time for students trying to get those seats. So when you're preparing for the 2020 curriculum, make sure you do have enough seats so you don't have that wait time during this activity. There is another class activity in Module 9, and it is a misuse activity similar to what we did in the 2015 curric 2014 curriculum for Skills 3. This does occur inside the classroom, and you will set up the misuse scenarios based on the instructions provided on the instructor guide on page 9-3. There are many suggested scenarios listed depending on the seats that you have available to you. We'll when you set up the scenarios, students will have to answer the following questions. What is the car seat make and model? What is the type of car seat? Is the car seat under recall? Does the car seat fit the age, height, and weight of the child? Are the harness straps rotted correctly? Is the harness snug? Is the retainer clip used correctly? And are any non-approved products being used? The students will answer these questions based on the scenarios that you provide. And for the same activity, for question one, when students are asking, what is the car seat make, model, and date? We noticed that for our situation, some of our car seats, you'd have to touch the car seat and disrupt the misuse scenario to get this information. If this is the case for you, you can verbally give this information or provide written notes. And for question three, is the car seat type appropriate for age slash size? You may also change this to, is the car seat type appropriate for the child's age? The correct answer is gonna be based on the car seat manufacturer directions, as well as best practice guidelines. And this could be a good discussion for your class on the difference between the two and, and how we always wanna promote good, better, best as CPS technicians and instructors. And something to kind of look out for in the next few months, leaders in the child passenger safety world are going to develop an FAQ guide for these activities and skills that all instructors can use in the field. It's currently being created, but that'll be something really helpful we can use as well when developing our skills assessments and as well as our activities in class. Now I wanna to transition to talk about our skills assessments. So skills one is the same as a 2014 curriculum, so we're not gonna emphasize it in this webinar, but skills two, and it, skills two is the same as a 2014 curriculum as well, but two helpful hits that I learned from other instructors in the field include printing out the laminated cards for the harnessing scenarios one through four. So you can print the weight and age of the dolls, and then you can put those laminated cards next to your dolls so students know what dolls go with what scenarios, and it helps your skills assessment stay organized. And for skills two, especially for larger classes, you can split the class in half so half the class and half the instructors start with harnessing and the other half of the instructional team and the other half of students start with installations. The biggest thing if you decide to do it, split the class in half is make sure that you have a large variety of seats so things can continue to keep moving. There are some major changes to skills three and skills three is administered similar to a quiz. Students answer the questions on their skills three answer sheets and turn in the answer sheets to their instructors. When you receive a student's skill three answer sheet, make sure you collect the pictures from the back of their technician guide. And then the lead instructor will then dispose of those photos after class is complete. We don't want students leaving with those pictures and sharing them with other people who may take the class in the future. So now I wanna to talk to you about Skills 4. So Skills 4 is the car seat checkup event 
and a student has to successfully demonstrate at least seven of the 10 actions. So what are these 10 actions? Action number one, engage the caregiver in the education process utilizing the learn, practice, explain principle. Number two, demonstrate active listening skills. Number three, respond well to specific caregiver questions. Number four, use a positive tone of voice. Number five, encourage best practice, but accept good or better. Number six, provide the caregiver praise on what was done correctly. Number seven, demonstrate knowledge of state laws as it relates to good, better, and best. Number eight, present relevant information to the caregiver. Number nine, refer to car seat labels, manuals, and the technician guide as needed. And number 10, correct misuse errors. This, again, students have to get seven yeses to successfully complete skills four. If they get a no, they can do a second attempt to get that no to a yes. If a student has a no on skills four, they do not successfully complete skills four, therefore do not successfully complete the class. Let's say you have a student who's lead and they have six yeses and four non-applicables. They, they weren't able to meet at least seven of the 10 actions. If that is the case, you'll have the student repeat again and then you can make sure they get at least seven out of 10 yeses to successfully complete skills four and therefore become a CPST. Students will work in teams of two or three and each student will serve as lead at least once. And each instructor can be responsible for supervising up to five students. So in theory, one instructor can have a group of two and a group of three students. Timing for this will be important. If you can, stagger when your students start the car seat checks so caregivers are not leaving at the same time. Our skills for, again, I want, we want our car seat checkup event to be at least two hours, and you want to designate a car seat checkup event coordinator who is not part of the instructor team. This person will promote the event, schedule appointments, recruit volunteers, make sure that there are enough supplies, develop a traffic safety plan, as well as secure the area. In the Griffin CPSD class, we partner with the local Safe Kids coordinator and she planned our checkup event for the local Walmart. For the Columbus CPSD class, we partnered with a program coordinator at the health department and we had it right there at the health department. Both work, it's whatever works for your community and for your organization. But you always want to partner with local Safe Kids coalitions and fitting stations. These organizations are where families in your communities trust, and you're more likely to have a higher participation if it's an agency that they're used to working with and they're comfortable with. And local CPSD's friends and the instructional team can serve as caregivers. With the Columbus CPSD class in February, the event was all promoted and made the local news but it was a cold, rainy, 30 degree February morning. We had a few caregivers come, but we still had low attendance. The lead instructor, she knew this was coming and anticipated it. She asked for five instructors to come to our car seat checkup event so we would have enough people to leave mocks if we had low attendance. So again, you know your community, you know the weather, and so if you see that coming, ask friends, ask local CPSDs, other instructors to help prepare for those mock scenarios. And the most important thing is that each student has the opportunity to serve as lead technician at least once. We want our techs to be comfortable educating families in the community and having that good curbside manner. The last thing I want to talk to you today about are the different resources available on the National Child Passenger Safety Board website. There are curriculum webinars. They're super helpful and they're not very long. I have watched all of them, and the topics include adult learning, how to download the materials, how to mentor, module two, good, better, and best, skills three, skills four, and testing protocol. The one that I thought was most helpful was the one on how to mentor instructors on the instructional team. But again, they are all awesome and they have great information. 
All the forms and PowerPoints are available for download. And there's also teaching aids. So if you go to the instructor in-store update, there's additional resources for what you can do for current text in the field. So how to have a successful technical update, sample invites for text, sample agendas, sample thank you notes. And then on the bottom right hand page of this website, there are instructor tip videos where you can get different tips and tricks from instructors across the country on different CPS topics in the field and in your classroom. Two more resources that I wanna highlight are the planning and logistics guide. This talks about program goals, checklist, if you're the course administrator or if you're the lead instructor, as well as different course confirmation emails from students. The instructor prep guide talks about how to facilitate skills one through four, administer quizzes, as well as sample agendas. And I read both before implementing the 2020 curriculum, and I definitely recommend that for everybody as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you so much for participating in this webinar today and have a wonderful day. Thank you again. Hello, thank you for joining me for a new curriculum, Preparing the Team. My name is Jesse Hopkins and I'm a Regional Program Manager with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. I've been a Child Passenger Safety Technician Instructor since 2009. And in my previous role, I served as the State of Illinois CPS contact, as well as the Occupant Protection Coordinator. So today I'd like to offer you some resources uh, to hopefully help address the individual needs of the adult learner in your course delivery as you embark on the new revised Child Passenger Safety Technician Training Curriculum. Some items we're going to cover include adult learning theory, the Learn, Practice, Explain model, meeting generational needs, supporting adult learning styles, and finally tackling challenges. So to discuss adult learning theory, we should first define learning. And Merriam-Webster defines it as the acquisition of knowledge or skills through experience, study, or by being taught. Uh, simply stated, it's figuring out how to do something that you couldn't do before. But how that looks in adults varies uh, widely. And some of the common misconceptions are that everyone wants to learn, that everyone learns the same way, in the same manner, from the same materials, that learning is just a little bit of studying and memorization, and that everyone can apply and wants to apply what it is they've learned, and that every learner looks like this, ready to go, eager, have all the supplies and tools they need for a classroom-style elementary education really understand how adults learn, we should know how to compare that to how a child learns or pedagogy. So for children, learning is a lot of memorization. It's a lot of repetition and it's by and large measured with standardized testing. But for adults, learning needs to be conceptual, uh, it needs to be contextual, and it needs to be continual and build upon their prior knowledge. And so a lot of what we hear and discuss or see in regards to adult learning theory goes back to Knowles and his four principles of andragogy uh, that were published in 1984. And this kind of still encompasses a lot of the behavioral and cognitive psychology that we know to support adult learning. And, and those four are that Adults need to be involved. Uh, they need to be a part of their learning. They need to have a stake in their learning. Experience provides the basis for that learning. And adults are problem-centered and, and task-oriented. Adults are motivated by things that they can apply immediately to their own lives. So some characteristics of the adult learner, and sometimes these are called assumptions, but those include a self-concept, and that's that adults are responsible for their own decision-making. They're capable of self-directed learning. Their experience plays an important role. Their prior knowledge and practical experience are gonna be drawn on continuously as they try to, to 
find new uses for that information. Their readiness to learn, that desire typically comes from some type of change in work or a developmental stage in life, uh, oftentimes with maturity. Consider the orientation to learning, the problem-centeredness -centered over subject-centeredness. They want that immediate application. And the motivation with adults becomes internal. So how does the CPS Technician Certification Training Model support adults? Well, it's through a little thing we call Learn, Practice, Explain. And by little, I mean it's the entire foundation of the CPS curriculum. And you'll notice it throughout the instructor guide and the technician guide and the slides and videos for good reason, because it kind of takes all of those principles and, and all of the assumptions about the adult learner and rolls them into a, a palatable and packageable uh, way to, to get the information from instructor to technician and, and for technician to then apply it and give it to a caregiver. So you have a chance to learn the facts, the skills, the information. You then practice the facts, the skills, and the information. And then you explain the facts, the skills, the information. Learn, practice, explain, or LPE as we'll call it. And how does that support these adult learning theory characteristics? Well, First, let's look at the self-concept. By definition, adult learners have a self-concept of being in charge of their own lives, being responsible for their own decisions. They would need to be seen and treated, being capable of taking responsibility. Realize, though, that sometimes adults, when they enter a classroom, may revert back to the days when learning was passive, when they were expected to have that memorization and that repetition. Don't assume that they want to learn that way. Instead, empower them to take responsibility for their own learning. Adults are going to bring those experiences to their learning, good or bad. Uh, it can be a plus because it's a huge resource and a large part of their makeup. It can be a negative because it comes with a lot of bias and kind of a loss of objectivity. But experience is a resource for the adult learner and for the learners around them. It gives meaning to the, the new ideas and the skills they're acquiring. And really, experience is the source for an adult's entire self-identity. Also consider their readiness to learn. Adults learn when they choose to learn and when they're committed to learning. And like we said, that desire usually coincides with the transition in one of life's stages. It could be career planning, it could be trying to attain new job skills, it could be an attempt to improve their job performance. Uh, be aware though that some of your learners just aren't going to want to be there. And that's okay. Acknowledging it and that there's not much you can do about it. It is just one way to kind of tackle it head on. The hope is when you find ways to tap into those experiences and the self-concept, those learners may turn that around. That readiness and commitment uh, may be supported when you, when you play on these other characteristics. Consider their orientation to learning and organize the content around easily defined tasks. Uh, chunking, as you'll see it called throughout the curriculum. Organize around those small pieces, not entire subject. Uh, education, by and large, is just subject-centered, but adult training really needs to be task-centered. And finally, motivation. Adults are motivated to put their time and energy into things that they know there's a benefit from. So finding a way to draw that bridge and, and make it relevant is so important. Try to think of a way to, to answer the question for students, what's in it for me? So what resources are available to enhance your learn, practice, explain skills? Through the National Ch Child Passenger Safety Board, or NCPSB, 
you can find additional resources in the Instructor Materials Portal. Some of those items include webinars, webinars like adult learning theory, how can we be better instructors, mentoring, make us all stronger together, testing protocols and instructor guidelines. In addition to webinars, there are instructor tip videos, how to motivate the voluntold student, how to assist a student needing help, how do you manage the student that is trying to help teach the course, and many more. There's additional handouts and supplement materials such as curriculum add-ons, do's and don'ts. And I'd also recommend consulting the CPS Express, the National Child Passenger Safety Board Facebook, and other reputable publications, but use caution. So now let's talk about how we can apply that, that learn, practice, explain, and, and adult learning theory principles uh, to different types of learners. And we'll first touch on the different generational needs. With five different generations potentially in the workforce and, and I guess more likely to be in your CPS course, uh, it's important that we recognize the differences in, in these learning styles uh, that we see across generations. And so although they only make up 3% of the, the current work Course and potentially CPS course, uh, we're going to cover traditionalists. Traditionalists are often referred to as the silent generation. Some things to know with this group is that they're apprehensive to try new things and can be sensitive to feedback. So being careful with your, your phrasing and your feedback is essential to keeping a traditionalist motivated and engaged. They can be very self-critical, so it's important to celebrate those small wins along the way. Traditionalists are those born between 1928 and 1945. The next group, making up about 33% of the workforce, is the baby boomer. Baby boomers are categorized as those born between 1945 and 1960. Uh, baby boomers aspire to have job security, uh, their careers are often defined by their employer. They prefer a focused structure and desire feedback from that instructor. Uh, they really don't like to depart from the expectations. If you have times on your agenda, you better be following the times on that agenda. Uh, otherwise, you're not really supporting their preferred learning method. Um, Boomers prefer to communicate face-to-face, -face, um, but telephone and email are other communication styles that we've seen this generation immerse themselves in. The next generation that you'll likely see in your course is Generation X, and that's those born between 1961 and 1980. They make up the largest portion of the workforce and likely then your CPS class. Uh, some things to know about the Gen Xers is they value work-life balance. They want their learning to be self-directed and independent, and they prefer that individual attention. Um, they're going to tend to shy away from the group exercises because they're more intrinsically motivated. Gen Xers tend to be loyal to their profession, but not necessarily to their employer. The next generation that you will see in your courses is Gen Y, or the Millennial. Millennials value freedom and flexibility. They prefer activity-based learning and the use of technology. They really enjoy collaboration but desire constant change. And they're only going to value learning when it's applicable to their lives. And really that spans all generations, but it's especially meaningful to this generation. And then the last group that you'll see in your courses that hasn't had a, a defined end cap uh, but it's safe to say we won't see uh, another generation in our courses anytime soon since the age requirement is 18, uh, but it's that Gen Z group born after 1997. Uh, Gen Zers really crave security and stability. They're considered multitaskers in personal and career lives. Um, they're heavily immersed in technology and they often have a shorter attention span because of it. 
They also desire that instant feedback, although not necessarily feedback from the instructor, feedback in some type of cue or reward. So in addition to supporting the different generations, there's also different ways to support different learning preferences. And that could be a visual preference, auditory preference, or tactile preference. Basically, people who say, oh, if I see it, I remember it, or oh, if I hear it, I've got it. I need to practice something before I can learn it. Those are kind of the three learning preferences we see with different adult learners. And so visual learners, yeah, they're looking, seeing, viewing. The curriculum helps support that through the videos, through the slides, the charts, and the demonstrations. Those auditory learners, they're, they're listening, they're hearing, they're speaking. They're reinforcing that knowledge best through lecture, through group discussions, through sharing stories and personal examples. And then the hands-on or, or tactile learners, they're experiencing it, they're moving, they're doing it. Uh, they really receive that information through things like role playing, uh, through simulations and demonstrations. Even the progress check in the technician guide is a good way for a tactile learner to, to retain that info because they're, they're physically doing something with their hands, thus more likely to retain. But something important to understand about retention is you retain about 10% of what you see retain 30 to 40 percent of what you see and hear, you retain 90 percent of what you see, hear, and do. Thus, learn, practice, explain. It's going to give the most opportunity for your adult learner to play up all of those learning preferences. So now that we've covered how to support the generational needs and, and how to support the learning styles, let's talk about tackling challenges. And challenges can come in many forms, uh, whether it be accommodation or a struggling student. But let's get into some guidance for meeting uh, special needs. There are guidelines in the instructor prep guide that get into more detail. But you should know, uh, at least at a bare minimum, the physical requirements of the course, that those need to be provided in a description to the students. It should be clear before a student gets to a course what is expected of them. Uh, students should be told to contact their course administrator or the lead instructor if there are any doubts about the ability to fulfill the course requirements. Recourse communications are a great opportunity to cover all of that information. Uh, also, at the beginning of the course, before the, the full day is done, before the agenda uh, and introductions get rolling, the instructor must ask if anyone has a special need with regard to meeting the requirements of that course, including testing considerations. Students should be asked to let an instructor know but do it during a break instead of asking for a show of hands as to not uh, shame or humiliate the participant. Another opportunity for you to meet those special needs as an instructor is during the introductions and before each quiz. The instructor must remind the students that two testing rooms are made available, the first being a silent room and the second being a reading room. Again, the instructor guide goes into more detail about what exactly those look like. And finally, during introductions and before each of the skills evaluations, an instructor must remind students that they are perverted to verbally guide an instructor if they are physically unable to work in a vehicle identifying the seatbelt systems and or installing car seats or booth seats. So physical limitations does not necessarily prohibit a potential technician from completing the course. If they can give clear verbal instructions in a concise manner with a correct explanation for those decisions and actions, uh, then they, they can be certified as a child passenger safety technician. So how do we work with struggling students? Well, to know how to fix a problem, first I guess you have to know what the problem is. Um, so really try to get to the heart of what's wrong. Are they having issues because they're just not good test takers? 
is the student by and large just not interested in being there or not motivated? Is the information overwhelming? Is it too much? Three to four days is a lot to absorb the amount of, of knowledge being thrown at them. So consider all these factors when you have a difficult student. An effective instructor is gonna identify students that are struggling and try to address that problem swiftly. You can adjust your teaching strategies to help adult learners of all types, whether it be a generational need, whether it be a physical or a test taking need, whether it be trying a different learning style or just pairing them with a different partner. Patience, empathy, and active listening are crucial to help your students overcome their obstacles and any barriers to learning. Remaining objective and unbiased is going to give you the, the best chance of success. Uh, directly from the technician guide here, consider why the caregiver and student is there. Caregivers are motivated by many factors, including safety, compliance with the law, and convenience. As educators, CPSTs should try to meet people where they are. We know that challenges exist in everyone's life. You have to consider that the caregiver has sought out help to acquire the tools or resources they need to transport their child safely. And at the end of the day, that is the number one goal, that everyone leaves safer than they arrive. So meet people where they are. Consider what it is they're really asking and what it is they really need. Caregivers and students alike, they're going to assign importance to different factors for different reasons. Don't discount or malign a factor that may be important to them just because it isn't your top priority. And when in doubt, go back to the four effective communication techniques also featured throughout your instructor guide and the technician guide. And those are, keep it simple. Notice I didn't add stupid. And it's important that we remove that from our words as well. Uh, keep it simple. When educating, keep your audience in mind. Students and caregivers are bringing their past experiences and words and abbreviations mean different things to different people. Keep it short. You're providing an overwhelming amount of information over the course of, of the CPS class. So make sure you're being concise. Give them everything they need, but keep it to what's necessary, not what's just nice to know. Keep it positive. Be mindful of your tone, of your body language, and be sensitive to those cultural, religious, and socioeconomic factors. And keep it real. Make the information relevant and applicable. So how do we measure success? Well, what, what are the goals of the CPS training? Well, there's two. Provide the basic technical knowledge about car seats, booster seats, and seatbelt systems. And the others to create opportunities for us to develop and practice that effective communication that educates caregivers on the safe transportation of children. And the purpose, why are we here? Well, completion of the course results in certification as a CPS tech. But we know that the goal is for every car seat, for every occupant to leave safer than they arrived. So how you educate your future technicians is going to directly impact how they educate the caregivers. In modeling Learn, Practice, Explain, we're reinforcing that we are educators and not installers, thus giving families the best chance of succeeding. And as I say, set them up to succeed, a CPS technician's experience getting certified from the registration all the way through that course completion. It's gonna directly impact their level of engagement. Being effective and positive, and pair it with opportunities to succeed, it's gonna increase the likelihood that those techs retain that certification, and that they stay active in their local CPS communities. The instructor's job isn't done as soon as class wraps up. An effective instructor is gonna to continue to make connections, bridge communications for technicians and partners long after the course. Is your team prepared? I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. Today's information was drawn on from these sources. And if you have additional questions or comments, please feel to contact me, the information provided. 
Thank you so much and have a great day.